Hello, everyone. Today, I'm delighted to welcome a trio of mothers, three moms, to the show. Trish Albanese, Liz Goldenberg, and Marilyn Jeffrey. Uh, these three ladies have come together to push New York State to develop more uh, accessible housing, or perhaps more correctly, to change their laws to make it possible for parents and advocates to create accessible housing. Some of you have heard a recent show I did about New Jersey, where they have uh, have developed or are in development of more than the 50 units of accessible housing. That kind of model is something they dream about in New York. So welcome to the show, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. It's Stephen. nice to be here. Thank you. So Trish, you're the founder of this organization, this nonprofit you've created called Smoky Hollow. Tell me a little bit about how that came about and what problems you were trying to resolve for your families. So I spent about 15 years working for a service provider. I felt like I knew the options and the opportunities that could that could exist. Um, and I think being naive, but being driven by my son really sort of pushed a model to be developed where a group of individuals can choose to live in close proximity. Um, in New York State, it's important to share staff. The resources are fixed, even though they're they're substantial. They're still not enough for people with 24 seven. Um, so yeah, I developed a model and sort of naively pitched it to New York State. Um, they weren't having it. They they almost didn't know what to think about it. They had never heard of such a thing. And so those conversations were frustrating. They were literally one-way conversations with New York State. So before you go any further, Trish, let's back up a bit. What model of housing were they they thinking of that was so and what made yours so very different? Let's perhaps make that clearer. Yeah. You know what? I think on their end, I have to be honest, they did not have a process to listen and respond to any models that weren't their own. Mm. That's what's changed. And that's why I think what we experienced as the time went by, and, and oh, by the way, being moms, we're not going away. I mean, there are another, there are no other options and we don't have any other options. So yeah, but you're well, not, you're, you're not a seasoned political operative either, or, or yeah, you know, yeah. experts on how to tackle bureaucracy. <laughs> Don't upset a parent and tell them something you can't do. <laughs> that's not the way. Um, ah. That's not the way. So I think early on, those months were, it, it felt like a listening party, but they were really trying to dismiss us. There, there's no doubt. That you were proposing that they didn't want to listen to. Yeah. So our model, Smoky Hollow, and it can vary and it can be replicated so people can kind of think about what they feel about this and sort of tweak it for themselves. But if you had say 12 one bedroom apartments with some common areas, um, secured building, then people can come and go as they, as they choose with their staff or with support, um, lead their lives and come back to a very safe permanent housing situation where over time, we'll build a community because you'll know your neighbors. It's not a large high rise. It's one now in upstate New York, we've got more land than say in some metropolitan areas. Um, but over time, those common areas will allow for community, natural community that will develop over time and relationships where staff can support more than one person at a time if needed, depending on what that what that looks like. The issue New York State had that they never really said out loud was that, first of all, that's too many people living together. That looks like an institution. 12 units? <laughs> and so it wasn't, okay. so it's like we, we, we had to think, is it, is it the percentage or is it the cap? Like, is it the total number or is it the percentage? Is it the composition? And really what we ran into was they cited this 25% rule that hmm. to not look like an institution services for services to be allowed to be provided in that setting 
it had to fall within the 25% rule, which what I'll explain is no more than 25% of individuals that live in a setting can get services and have developmental disabilities. So we asked for that in writing. I, we understood where and how it came from. It came, it came from integrated setting and financing and all of those things that are complicated. We get that. Right, but also New York has this history. It had that scandal back in the 60s with, with that center where they Willow did the Brooke. whole expo. Thank you, yes, Willowbrook. So I, yeah, so there's a lot of hesitancy about, oh my God, if it's an institution, that's really awful. So I kind yeah. of understand the paranoia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, the risk, the risk and the experience that we had at Willowbrook is um, inconceivable. And yet I get that they don't want to repeat that, but the risk of not doing anything leads, leaves thousands of families and individuals with right. an inability and, to plan. Right. And so you were, I was learning earlier that the, the issue, we're not talking here about high functioning kids on the autism spectrum or independent people who live with CP or people who've got uh, d disabilities later in life who have led independent lives. The community that is being not served here, if I understand it correctly, are folks requiring 24 seven support. Is that right? That's so true. I would assume that's true nationwide, but in, in New York state, there's only really two choices. And one is to remain living with your family, which we know isn't sustainable. Um, and I don't know how many individuals really want to live with their parents for the rest of their lives. <laughs> um, or a group home, which is the New York State sort of certified option, um, where it's a house with a number of residents. You don't get to choose your roommate. You don't get to choose your staff. You don't get to choose maybe where you'll live. So it's just the opposite of person-centered um, choice making, and it really doesn't empower anyone to make the choices that they that they want for their lives. So I want to bring in uh, Marilyn and Liz at this point. Were you guys feeling, uh, as Trish was when she began this project, the same kind of frustration about where your kids were going to? live when they were too old to live at home and and and, and group homes being and not a good option absolutely you know we this were is really Marilyn talking right thank now. you yeah we were really concerned because the options were so limited and we were actually discouraged from group homes because in new york state there are very few of them recently they've been closing and if you do get a spot your child your adult child can be placed anywhere in an eight county region so they're removed from their community and everybody they've ever known. And my son, who's turning 22, might be put in a home with 70 year olds. So it just wasn't appropriate. It didn't meet his needs. It didn't meet his interests. It was very frustrating that there were so limited options for my son. So Liz, do you want to comment? Yeah, um, what, what I was thinking is that when, when my daughter, you know, when I knew as, as, as she was, when she was a baby, I knew that there were issues. And as she was a, a toddler, I was like, no linoleum floors for my daughter, which is like, no, nothing that would ever resemble an institution for her. But I didn't know what that was, what that would mean. And when I talked to Trish and heard about the plan of Smoky Hollow, it was just like genius because it makes sense. It makes sense that um, we can share staff. My, my daughter and Trisha's son are very close. They see each other often. I, my daughter, I'd say, was, is in love with Trisha's son. And so to be able to live with, with people who are similar to you, but still be included in your community every day, which our children are, they're out in the community every day, and then they can go home and be in a place that feels like home to them. It just, it just makes so much sense. Right, but to clarify, this thing you're creating, Smoky Hollow, hasn't come about yet, right? Right. Yes, correct. Yep. So tell Me. us a little bit about the project. Sure, sure. So the project in the building, the building is really, I think, what I want to highlight. The building and that common area and those one-bedroom apartments, you know, the, the, the need for all of us to have privacy and dignity on those days that we really don't want to put a face on and be out beyond our four walls 
the building ends up looking very much like a senior assisted living type of building, which I don't know if you got, you know, so one story, you know, accessible. Um, and that's when I sort of knew this really does make sense. I mean, even if it's going to be hard, if this is the type of building that's the gold standard to take care of our elderly vulnerable population, we have to be on to something. Um, the safety aspect is also critical. So if, if my son Mike could live in an integrated setting, if he had the skills to live, the self-preservation to live in an integrated setting, I think that would be fantastic. But the safety issues in an integrated setting aren't necessarily what, what he needs. Um, and actually a byproduct that I don't know if people really have thought through is, are people really integrated in an integrated building? Or are they isolated? And I would argue there's a lot of isolation. So, so we we started pitching to New York. I think they secretly really liked the idea between the four of us and all your podcast mm -hmm. listeners. I think they really did. Um, I think their jobs creating policy are more challenging than certainly that than than I could do. Um, but I think we knew at the end of the day, that's discrimination. If you can't, if you can't, if you can tell a person where they can't live, that's, that's not, no three moms are going to put up with that. And so we, we did pursue legislation to let them know we weren't going away. And were, were legislators and politicians open to what you were saying? What happened? Yeah, we, we had some great bill sponsors, um, certainly in New York state. And other states, there's probably disability committees, but we did get two bill sponsors um, that they were both parents. You know, one had more of a high functioning adult son, and one had um, more of a son like like our kids. So just to just to clarify, I'm sorry to interrupt. You needed politician support so you could get rid of this 25 percent rule, so that you could develop right. this plant this this community. Otherwise, right. you wouldn't be able to develop the community at all. Right. And you know what? We were open if the state said, let's do this as a pilot. But you know, when you're on the side of doing right and good, and this is a social justice issue. And I think we thought, look, we're halfway there anyway. Let's just write, let's just write legislation to get it all the way there so that we can ensure that it's replicable for other people. So that's what we did. We got a ton of support. Um, this bill, the bill that we wrote, you know, the irony of it is it just allows for choice. Hmm. It costs no money. It costs no money. Wow. Um, and so the bipartisan, the bipartisan support that we got, which was key, um, was throughout the state, which was, which was very rewarding. I will say that in, in New York state, there, there, there is some bureaucracy and some politicking and so forth. And although it passed in our assembly, unanimously. Um, it did not make it out of committee in our Senate. So we will start all over again and do it in January. And we'd love to update you, but we are cer certainly very confident that that bill will go through. So you can't break ground or, or, or get your development going until this happens, right? Well, you know, what's interesting is they removed the 25% rule because of our advocacy. Oh, so what do you need the bill for now? Um, I think we need it because it's the right thing to do. And and I'll may, may I jump in here, Trish? And also we need it to we need it for permanence. Right now it's an it was regulation that was changed, which could easily be changed back uh. if the administration changes. So we need if it's if it's a bill and it's law, then it will then it, it will be permanent. Then we can we can something we can hang our hats on and know that our children will be okay because we need I think that's the difference between the assisted living for for elder population versus our children is that they're going to be around for a long time so um, yeah. it's really important that we think long term. Thank you, Liz. That makes sense. Yeah, I think New York State um, is coming to the table more than more than they have, but they've they've been forced to do so. Um, we take a lot of pride in that. Um, I think we want them to know we're not going away. I think I think they they really secretly respect us. I may be completely off <laughs> off target there, um, 
but they don't have answers to this, you know, to this population. But all they have to do is look around the country. I mean, not just in New Jersey, who who I just, you know, as I mentioned off the top, we did a show on it. I just did a show on the success in New Jersey. But in other states, there's all kinds of um, accessible uh, uh, properties being developed for rental or ownership purposes, uh, tied in with support for 24-7 all the way to high-functioning people, uh, a whole spectrum of support. So it, it baffles me that such a, a populist state and such a uh, progressive one, if I may say so, politically, uh, nationally anyway, is, is so seems a little behind the eight ball on this stuff. What do you think? I'm trying to be respectful. As I <laughs> these words, everybody, it it's irresponsible. Yeah, their management um, up up to now, and I hope we are at the beginning of some change. We've been treated not well. We've been dismissed. Um, it's irresponsible. If we knew the lack of accountability um, as parents, it it's baffling to me. I don't I don't have an answer for that. And I think Liz does. I, no, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that okay, at all. Okay. <laughs> but, but I hope. I have hope because I think since we've had a new administration, things have changed. That's where we saw the twenty-five percent rule go away. So it's it it does give us it gives us a lot more hope than what we had originally. And I think that I I, I feel more respected than I did with the prior administration. Thank you for sharing that, Liz. And you know, I have a national audience. And they struggle with their politicians, maybe not over such this fundamental issue that you have been struggling with, but they struggle with their politicians and their legislatures and their policy wonks in government, bureaucrats. What advice uh, do you have for advocates in other states who are struggling to make progress on the accessible housing front, no matter what their challenge is specifically? What, what would you say they should do? From your experience? Yeah, I, like when I talked at the beginning about being naive, I, I really think parents have all the credentials that they need. They really do know what's best for their for their adult loved one. Um, so that's first and foremost. Don't worry about all the regs and people that wanna get extra certifications to learn. I think it's already in, in you to create and dream something. Um, I did listen to your podcast with Tom Toronto, um, Marilyn and I drove down to visit um, a, a couple of properties. If there's something like that close to you to visit a, a, a true success story, I mean, New Jersey's heaven in, in my mind. We were blown away at how beautiful it was, how happy the residents were, I mean, it allowed us to really dream at a at an even larger level. Have you ever, so two things I want to say, and then I want to hear from Liz has her hand up, but very uh, briefly about that interview. Tom also mentioned in my discussion with him about how all of their different developments were driven by parents standing up at a planning meeting or standing up in front of their legislators and saying, this isn't working the way we're doing things. We need this plan that Tom is proposing. So I think that's really, really uh, uh important, the power of the people or the power of parents who wanted to have the best for their kids. Uh, Liz, you were going to add something? Yeah, that's what I wanted. That's actually what I wanted to say. It's the power of, of in this situation, moms joining together, because I don't think any of us could do it on our own. But to but to do it together has been pretty amazing. I've been calling us moms moving mountains. And I feel like that's what we're that's what we've been doing. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And, and if I could step in for a minute. Um, I think Please. it's really important what Tom Toronto told us when we visited those properties in New Jersey, that there was a change of leadership in their state agency uh, in charge of the well-being of their, their population with IDD. So as Trish mentioned, we tried over and over again, and you know we try to maintain a relationship with them, but we also went to our legislators and, and started this build process. And the way to build that is to start reaching out to your local legislators who are state legislators and develop relationships with those offices. Find out who the chief of staff is, develop that relationship, tell them what you're doing, what you want, what your problems are. And remember, they work for you. 
they work for the voters and the taxpayers. So we, we found that everybody has a connection to people with IDD one way or another. And they were very helpful for the most part. Almost every office was very um, sympathetic to our situation, helped us. And that's what you need to build a coalition. So I, I really um, encourage people to do that. Reach out, call, email. But I think calling is the most effective way to establish that relationship and get them on board with what you're trying to do, whether they can make a phone call for you or whether they can vote for legislation. But you really have to reach out to every possible resource. Some people can't help you in the moment, but they might give you a good referral and networking is key. Yeah, it, it's what I hear from advocates all around the country is the importance of, of, uh, of how it seems to always be parents that drive have driven forward the the strides and and successes we've seen in all aspects of ad advocacy for people with disabilities, not just in the housing front. But um, so, where is the project at? Um, uh, given that you uh, uh, have got this new the reg change, the regulations change, so there's not a logistical obstacle around that. What, what's what's going on with creating this housing? You're talking about a 12 unit. Uh, community. Yeah, the the next steps are really how to how to finance it, and mm -hmm. and you know one key aspect that makes Smoky Hollow different is the units will be owned by the residents. So we're looking at a home ownership model, but because right now the systems for public money are all aligned with integrative type of housing, um, we need to do this privately. And I think there will be some aspects of public money, you know, available, but at this point is really thinking about um, foundations that align their mission with ours, which I have to tell you, so many missions align with ours, you know, <laughs> vulnerable population, social change, um, you know, women owned, um, accessible understood. housing. Yeah, underserved. Yeah. Could you see the size and scope of the project changing based on alliances you might forge with other advocates who have slightly different perspectives? Yeah. Yeah. I think we've always remained open. I think we've always known it's not going to be easy. And, you know, when smart people come together and, and can propose something, not just, oh, here's this money, so now do this. I mean, we go to the core things that are important to our loved ones, which is, which is safety. And so as long as it's as long as it's safe, then we would be open to that. Yep, for wow. sure. So, you know, we're talking about a process. Um, and, you know, I know in my state, everything takes three times as long as anyone wants it to because of all the quote unquote bureaucracy, regulation, uh, nimbyism, et cetera, et cetera. What, what do you think is a realistic time frame for when uh your venture, Smoky Hollows, could open 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 a door, have people living in in housing. Good question. And I want to see if Liz and Marilyn think the same way I do. I think we would um, break ground in under two years and be open in three. I'm hoping for a quicker timeline, but that remains <laughs> to be seen. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of daunting. So how are your kids, where are they living now? And how is that working? I, I would, I'd like to start with that. Um, my, my daughter is living in her own house. We actually purchased a house so that she could go to high school in the specific school district. We all moved in there. She graduated from high school. The idea was we would sell the house, but we didn't. She's now living there with 24 seven care on weekends she comes to us and then during the week she's in her house and we are paying a lot of money it's not it's not sustainable it's working it's nice although she's segregated it's just she's living you know by herself in this house with people coming in and out which which it works you know it's not it's not ideal but it works but the biggest problem i see is that we can't we can't afford to do this to pay for 24 7 care for her and that's why i think smoky hollow is so genius is that at night she doesn't need somebody one-on-one -on -one with her so we have we could share so that her budget it's sustainable 
her budget will be able to pay for everything that she needs so that we don't have to pay privately for things that are happening for her. And my Marilyn? son lives still oh, with sorry. me. Trish. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. That's all right. So Trish, go ahead. My son still lives with me. He's 22. He lives with us. And Marilyn? My son lives with us, but my son is, um, he's very active and he is a limited communicator, but he has types that he likes to be with groups of people his age. Uh, so I envision him at Smoky Hollow as like a camp experience because he loves going to camp. And there are activities during the day that he's involved with in the community where he goes out with his one-to-one -one mentor. And that will continue when he's at Smoky Hollow, but in the evening when he doesn't need one-to-one, -one, he can participate in group activities or not because he'll have his own apartment. But what I foresee is that there'll be game night at Smoky Hollow and movie night and all those fun things that he likes to be involved with. So it'll be like camp all the time for him. Oh, wonderful. So I, I learned earlier that, you know, you mentioned it's a home, an ownership model. So the parents are going to buy in to be able to have their uh, child, uh, adult child uh, live there. Um, what kind of oh, doors will be opened by what you're doing for families of lesser means for their kids who First of all, 12 units is clearly not going to be enough to fill the need by any stretch of the imagination. But we need a model as well for that is an affordable model, too. Do you have any thoughts about that? You know, what has to happen is that the state then takes their accountability to us further. Um, you know, mm. tax credits, at least in New York State, are a big funding option and a vehicle to for all kinds of different populations. So the same thing would need to happen. It has to happen. I mean, the model and the supports are replicable. I do think the philanthropic um, and, and foundation uh, landscape, they will love this. Um, and I think parents can do it, but states um, will have to, they'll have to have line items in their budgets to allow this. I mean, I, they can't just want group homes. And, right. and I think they know that we don't we don't want group homes. And when I talk to advocates in other states, the whole group home thing is sort of fading. A lot of states are moving away from group home model. Marilyn, you were going to add something? Well, I think that Smoky Hollow is going to be a pilot. And a lot of individuals and parents and agencies are going to look at Smoky Hollow and then realize they can do the same thing on a slightly different scale maybe larger, maybe bigger, maybe rental versus ownership. But I think that that's why it's so important to get Smoky Hollow up and running because it's not just going to benefit our children. It's, it can likely benefit thousands across the state. And I also think that's why we've had such great support from our elected officials because they realize the scope of the issue and, and the fact that there has not been a solution for this population for decades. Right, right. Liz, what do you think? And I, I wanted to say that the, mo the the staff sharing model is actually going to save the state money in the end. It's using oh. it's using the funds efficiently when you can share staff as opposed to I'm going to give you this lump sum, I'm going to give you this lump sum, I'm going to give you this lump sum, and you're going to spend it all versus let's pull our lump let's pull our some sums of money together, and we'll pay you know it'll be more much more efficient use of of, of the budget. So you are imagining a situation where supportive agencies, agencies that provide in-home support, might one might have a contract for all 12 uh, yeah. residents, as opposed to lots of different support agencies providing individualized one-on-one -on -one Well, support. It's, all, it's all individualized, but there would be opportunities for agencies to replicate some other model for their- Oh, so you don't imagine a one, one service provider model? I think it's, it's honestly, it's up to the individual. So yeah. it can't be, right? Yeah. Um, at least in our model. Um, a lot of us ha use the same provider, um, but that's just because we've known each other. Our kids have known each other for so long, um, but it has to be up to the individual. And I, you know, and the state thinks that's very important and we, we agree. So we're almost out of time. So I have two last questions. First question is, is there anything that you want my listeners to know about your experience that we haven't touched on already that we should make sure we just touch on before we run out of time. I do want to talk to anybody with the 25% rule if they're starting to do things. And if this is their issue, 
um, they they certainly can reach out to us. But oh, I do that's my second question. <laughs> OK, yeah. I do want to say, you know, along the way, we were already looking to create legislation. But I just wanted to refer to um, a letter that fell into our lap by some angel. Um, so Brian Fitzpatrick, who is um, he's a congressman in Pennsylvania, he wrote Medicaid, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services specifically about this rule, because there are many, many states and he wrote with to this them. issue. He wrote to CMS. And he and is a, a legislator there? He's a congressman. A congressman. I there, believe. Yeah. And CMS wrote him back. CMS is the acronym for, for that office, the federal, you know, which is where a lot of the money comes from. And CMS wrote a letter back um, that it, it's based on the setting is no one gets to define what setting is appropriate for people, people get to define it for themselves. And so I'd be happy to share that letter, which was a game changer, I think, in our state. Um, it came at a really nice time. And I'd be happy to share that with anybody if if that helps their, you know, their creations and their developments. Wow. Uh, I wish we had more time. This has been such a great discussion. I really, really appreciate you all making the time. Um, uh, Trish, if people want to talk to you more about what's happened in New York with you guys and what you're trying to build, maybe it'll be instructive for them. How uh, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, um, we do have a website, Smoky Hollow Beville, B -V -I -L -L -E com. And you can contact us through there or on our Facebook page. You can look for Smoky Hollow or they can email uh, me directly at T Albanese, A-L-B-A-N-E-S-E 9257 at gmail.com. And I'll put all that in my show notes so that it's easy okay. for people to not have to remember. Um, so guys, thanks so much. Uh, this has been a really interesting and illuminating discussion, and uh, I see, I I see and hear the determination, and I have no doubt that this is going to have a positive outcome for your kids, and for the community, and for the society, uh, and for advocacy, and for civil rights, and everything that we've touched on. So, thank you for doing this um, and uh, making change happen. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having no. us. Fighting us, yeah.